Luke chapter 11. And look at verse number 1, Luke chapter 11, verse 1. And it came to pass that as he was praying in a certain place, when he ceased, one of his disciples said unto him, Lord, teach us to pray, as John also taught his disciples. The title of the sermon this morning is, Teach Us to Pray. Teach Us to Pray. So we see immediately here in verse number 1, we, we've seen this through the book of Luke so far, that it is uh, the custom of Jesus Christ to go and pray to his Father. You know, even after having busy periods of, of working the works of God, casting out devils, preaching to great multitudes, he still found time to go and pray to the Father. And, you know, that, that just brings a reminder to me. Because quite often, and I think you guys can probably share in this experience, is that when we have a busy day, you know, when there's a lot on our plates, probably the last thing that we do or the, last, the thing that drops off our radar is our prayer life. It might be the last thing that, you know, we're so busy, we've got so many things to do that we just forget to pray. And we see the great example of Jesus Christ praying to His Heavenly Father. You know, it's such a great example that His disciples ask Him, teach us to pray. They thought this is a, an amazing part of the ministry of Christ, an amazing part of His walk with God the Father. And they wanted to be taught to pray. And even we see John the Baptist taught his disciples to pray. All right? So this tells me a couple of things. Number one, that people don't know how to pray. I mean, even the disciples of Jesus asked, how do we pray? And number two, this tells me that we need to teach people how to pray. Okay? We need to teach especially our children how to pray. You know? And... Uh, you know, I believe prayer, you know, especially our midweek service, you know, our midweek service on Wednesday nights, when we come for church together, it is such a precious thing for us to pray together, bring our prayer requests to one another, and pray for one another. You know, I, I know some families can't attend on the midweek service, and, you know, I, I understand, but still, it's such a precious time, you know. It's a time where you can actually really build um, some relationships with the people in the church, you know, you understand the things that they're struggling with. You understand the things that you can pray for. And, you know, you may not have the power in yourself to fix those things, but you do have the ability to pray for those individuals. And I personally found when I started praying for people in my church, even in the past, you know, I started to love those people in my church more. I started to think about them more. You know, I started to stop thinking about my struggles in life and started to think about the struggles that other people have in their lives. And, you know, it brought to my attention to pray for them. And, you know, even as a pastor now in this church, I realize just how important it is for me to be in prayer to God about each individual person in this church, you know. And, yeah, you know, it's a great thing to be taught to pray. Look at verse number two. And he said unto them, When ye pray, say, Our Father which art in heaven, hallowed be thy name. Thy kingdom come, thy will be done, as in earth, sorry, as in heaven, so in earth. So a few things here. Number one, it says, look, when you pray, and by the way, this is known as the Lord's Prayer. And I've been in churches where, I don't know, maybe you've been there where people stand up and basically quote the Lord's Prayer word for word, you know. And, you know, obviously Jesus Christ told us to be, to be careful about the vain repetitions. You know, we shouldn't pray just a vain repetition, you know, pray the same prayer that we pray for every mealtime, you know, Lord, please bless the food to our bodies. And it's just, just rolls of the tongue without any thought to it. Now, I personally don't think there's anything wrong with repeating this prayer. You know, I, I personally, there's been times in my life where I've, I've, I've felt a bit distant from the Lord. And um, what's brought me closer to the Lord is opening a psalm and just reading that psalm, you know, and going, Lord, yep, that's my prayer to you, Lord. You know, because I, I, I don't know how to express how I'm feeling right now, but that psalm that I just read right now, that's my prayer to you, Lord. That's, that's what I want to lift up to you. I personally don't think there's anything wrong with taking a prayer, even an example prayer like Jesus Christ gave, as long as it's not a vain repetition, as long as it's not empty, that you actually mean what, what is being said here and you want to bring that before the Lord. But you notice that Jesus Christ is speaking to the Heavenly Father here. Okay, When we pray, we ought to pray to the Father, which art in heaven. And then he says, hallowed be thy name. What does that mean, hallowed? It means holy. Your name is holy. I'm lifting up your name. And this is another part of our prayer life that we need to get better at. That's praising the Lord. You know, it's very easy to come to the Lord and just be like, Lord, these are my problems. Help me out. <laughs> you know, please answer these prayers. 
But you know, we see that Jesus Christ spends a small moment there just to honor the name of God. You know, to give Him praise, to give Him worship, to be thankful for the things and the prayers that He's answered in our lives. You know, He's deserving of that praise. And then He says, Thy kingdom come. We see that the, the desire of Christ and the desire for that we all ought to have is for the kingdom of God to come. You know, and we know that kingdom is to come in the millennium. But we also know that we can add people to that kingdom today by our efforts in soul winning, our efforts to preach the gospel, to have these people, these precious people that Jesus died for, to enter into that kingdom. We ought to have a desire for the kingdom of God and not the kingdoms of this world. All right? Then he says, Thy will be done as in heaven, so in earth. Lord, we know your will is done in heaven, but your will is not always done on this earth. In fact, even in my own life, sometimes I pursue my own will rather than the will of God. And basically the desire that we ought to have is that our will would line up with the will of God, that we would want His will on this earth as much as it is in heaven. But I want you to notice there that when we pray, true prayer invokes the Trinity. Okay? First of all, we see that we ought to pray to God the Father. And you don't need to turn there, I'll just read to you very quickly in Ephesians 6.18. It says, praying always with all prayer and supplication in the Spirit and watching thereunto with all perseverance and supplication for all saints. So we, say, we see when we're praying, we're praying in the Spirit. Hey, when you're praying, it's that new man, it's that, 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 that new spirit that's been born of the Spirit that's calling out to God and praying to Him. Hey, we would not be able to go to prayer if we were not born again. If we had just this fleshly, sinful body, we would not be able to enter that throne of grace of God and bring our request before Him. The fact that we're calling Him our Father points that those that can pray are those that are children of God. You count yourself as a son of God. Hey, there's a lot of people in this world that pray, but they're not born again. They're not children of God, and they're not praying to the Father because He's not their Father. Okay, prayer is something that's been given as an honor to the children of God that we can approach Him. Yes, we know that He's the great God of the universe, but we can approach Him as our Father. Approach Him as we would as children to our earthly fathers in the same way. All right. But also, um, and I'll just, I'll just read to you quickly, John 14, 13. Jesus says, And whatsoever ye ask in my name, that will I do, that the Father may be glorified in the Son, and if you shall ask anything in my name, I will do it. So quite often when we finish praying, you know, quite often we'll say things like, you know, in Jesus' name. We ask these things, Lord God, in Jesus' name. So we can see that prayer invokes the Trinity. You know, it touches all aspects of who God is. Praying to the Father, praying in the Spirit, and asking in Jesus' name. Because that's where the power is. The power is in the name of the Lord Jesus Christ. It's through Jesus that He gives us access to the Father and obviously being able to be born again of the Spirit. Alright? So look at verse number 3. Give us day by day our daily bread. And I, I already know you guys don't pray this. I mean I, I mean, I assume that because I forget to pray this all the time. You know, thank God we live in a nation of, of plenty. You know, we don't really need to wonder, is there going to be food on the plate in the mornings? You know, in the, in the, is there going to be lunch? Is there going to be dinner? You know, there are parts of the world that definitely don't know if they're going to eat today, you know. But for us, you know, we, we've, we've been given abundance. But look, whether we have abundance or not, we see the example that Jesus Christ gave. Uh, gave and that is, we should petition God to give us our daily bread, to give us our daily food. You know, so, the, so you know, the Lord can see our humility, that we still need Him. We still need to call upon Him for those provisions, that we've acknowledged that those provisions are coming from the Lord. Otherwise, we can become quite haughty and lifted up and say, well, the reason we have what we have is because of me, because of, of what I've done, because of the work that I've done. Yes, that's true, but ultimately, it's, it's the Heavenly Father that's given you those good gifts. And we ought to ask and petition of those things, just even our daily bread. All right, just, just when you go to the store and you buy a loaf of bread, you know, you have, should have asked the Lord for that bread to begin with, okay? That's the example that Jesus Christ gave us. So even the smaller things, we're praying for the kingdom, we're praying for His will, but even so far as your morsel of bread that you're eating day by day. 
Verse number four. And forgive us our sins, for we also forgive everyone that is indebted to us. And lead us not into temptation, but deliver us from evil. I mean, think about that. Think about those words. All right, now this is not about salvation. You know, God has forgiven our sins through the righteousness and sacrifice of the Lord Jesus Christ. This is not about salvation. You're not asking for forgiveness in the sense of being saved. But you guys know that our position is set before Christ, and that's perfect because we have the righteousness of Christ imputed upon us, but we also have our walk with the Lord. That's not always righteous. That's not always great. Sometimes, you know, when we commit sin, we're, we're breaking fellowship with God. You know, we ought to come before Him and confess our sins to Him. And that's good. That's a good thing that we ought to do. But notice that there's a condition here. All right? And forgive us our sins, for we also forgive everyone that is indebted to us. Now, I'm going to read to you the same prayer just in Matthew 6, 12, because it's a little clearer here. It says, And forgive us our debts as we forgive our debtors. Wow. You know what that means? If you, have not, if you don't have forgiveness for people, you know, that have done you wrong, then you're essentially telling God, forgive me in the same way that I've forgiven others. Now, if you've forgiven others, that's a good prayer to pray, right? If you have a forgive, you know, people have done you wrong, but you, you know, the, you've forgiven them for the wrongs that they've done, then you have no problems because God will forgive you with those sins that you've committed, you know, and he'll restore that fellowship with you. But what if you're harboring bitterness? What if you're harboring anger against people and you've not forgiven them? Then what are you saying there when you ask for forgiveness for God? God says, well, I'll forgive you as, as far as you have forgiven those other people. And so, hey, you know, there might be times when you've asked for forgiveness for Christ and you're still not feeling his presence. You're still not fellowshipping with him. You're still not communing with the Lord. And you need to consider, is it because I've not forgiven others? Am I still holding on to grudges and bitterness of things that have happened in the past? And if you are, that's going to hurt your relationship with God the Father. That's going to hurt your walk with God the Father. Okay? So if you want to be forgiven by God in your daily walk, then you need to also forgive others that have wronged you. Okay? So this is really sobering, a really sobering thought because... You know, in our flesh, when people do us wrong, we, we hold the grudges a little bit, right? But then we expect God to forgive us for everything in our lives. Well, hold on. As long as I've forgiven others. That's the condition of God's forgiveness to you in your walk with Him. But also notice it says here, and lead us not into temptation. So obviously, you know, we, we want to ask God that He would maneuver our lives, that, you know, we, we would avoid the trials and difficulties and temptations that might come that causes us to sin. All right, we ought to ask God to help us in that area. But it doesn't end there. It says, but deliver us from evil. So even when I do face temptations, even when I do face hardships and trials, you're asking the Lord, look, deliver me. Give me a way of escape. Give me a way so I won't sin against you, Lord. You know, and that reminds me, and um, I'll just read it to you uh, in, in 1 Corinthians 10, 13. You can, turn, or you can turn there if you want. But 1 Corinthians 10, 13 and this is such an important verse. It says, There hath no temptation taken you, but such as is common to man. Hey, whatever trial, whatever temptation, whatever difficulty you're going through, it's common to man. Everyone goes through similar difficulties. And sometimes, and you know, and this happens because you get emotional, you get frustrated, and you're like, why is this happening to me? Why is, why is no one else being affected? No. Everyone goes through trials and difficulties, okay? The things you're going through is, is common, is normal, all right, to everyone. But then it says, But God is faithful and will not suffer you to be tempted above that ye are able. So when you go through trials of temptations, when you're tempted to sin, okay, God says He's not going to allow you to be tempted above what you're able to bear. That means, hey, there's no excuse for your sin. Or you can blame your sinful flesh, but that's essentially you're blaming yourself. Hey, when you're tempted to sin, you can't turn around and say, God, well, you allowed me to be in this situation, and therefore I've sinned. You can't blame God for your sins. Okay, when you're tempted, God makes sure that it's not something you can't overcome. Okay, so when you sin, it's your fault. Okay, it's your fault. And then it says, uh, but will that with the temptation also make a way to escape 
that ye may be able to bear it. Every time you're tempted to sin, God gives you an opportunity to escape that. Okay? You're not trapped and forced to sin. And we see that highlighted in this prayer. So lead us, uh, lead us not into temptation, Lord. Help us not to be in that situation to begin with. But when we are, when we're facing evil, things that can harm us, then please give us that opening that we can escape. Help me find that way of escape, Lord, so I won't sin against you. Um, verse number five. And he said unto them, Which of you have a friend, and shall go unto him at midnight, and say unto him, Friend, lend me three loves. For a friend of mine in his journey is come to me, and I have nothing to set before him. And he from within shall answer and say, Trouble me not, the door is now shut, and my children are with me in bed. I cannot rise and give thee. And I say unto you, Though he will not rise and give him, because he is his friend, yet because of his importunity, he will rise and give him as many as he needeth. All right? So the question that Jesus Christ is asking here is a hypothetical question. All right? When he says there in verse 5, which of you shall have a friend? It's kind of like, who would do this? So if you have a friend that's a neighbor and they have an urgent need, okay, and they come to your door, even if it's midnight, even if it's a time when your family's in bed and, and uh, you know, you're, you've wrapped up for the day, even when someone comes to your door knocking urgently for your help, he says, who of you would not you know, uh, attend to that if you're able to, to help in that situation? Okay, it's a hypothetical, all right? But the point is, in verse number 8, it says, um, Though he will, he will not rise and give him, because he is his friend, yet because of his importunity, he will rise and give him as many as he needeth. So that word importunity is basically um, the, 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 the urgency of the begging of that request that's coming. He's saying, look, the reason you're going to give to that person that's in need isn't so much because he's your friend, and yes, that's a part of it, but more so because of their need, because of their urgent request, okay? So, I mean, you could say a similar thing. Hey, if you had a neighbor come into your house, maybe he's not your friend. Maybe he's never someone you really got along with. Hey, but they come along and they're asking for urgent help, and you're able to fulfill that. You know, you're going to honor that because, you know, of, of the need and the, able, and the ability that you have to answer that need. And this ties in with praying. Okay, this ties in with praying. You know, you, you can fall into the trap and say, well, you know, the, the Lord knows my situation. The Lord knows what I need. And that can stop you from praying. That can stop you from asking the Lord what you need. But the answer, the thing is here, if you want your prayers answered, if you want your needs met, you have to come to the Lord and ask Him. That's what He wants. He wants that humility from you, you know, asking him uh, with that request, with that urgency, Lord, please answer these prayers. I need you to step in here and take care of this. That's what the Lord wants. That's how he's going to answer you. Not just because he's your friend, but because you've actually asked in, in, in that urgent haste. Okay, so that, that's the that's the teaching there. You want your, you want something answered. You have needs that need to be met. You need to take that to prayer to God. Okay? Our prayer life is such an important part of our Christian walk. Okay? And I find in just in my own life growing up, that it's that part that I tend to leave out. Okay? It's, that, it's that part when I'm busy uh, or I just don't feel right with the Lord. It's that part that I tend to leave out. And I'm telling you that because I assume you probably struggle with that same problem as well. All right? Look at verse number 9. And I say unto you, ask and it shall be given you. Seek and ye shall find. Knock and it shall be opened unto you. So what we see here in verse number nine is that answered prayer, to have your prayers answered, it's more than just asking. You know, when you come to the Lord and you bring your petitions before him, yes, you're asking him, aren't you? You're asking him, Lord, please answer this prayer. But that shouldn't be the end of it. He says, you got to seek and knock. Let me give you a practical example of this. You know, if you're looking for work, you're unemployed, you're looking for work, yes, you take it to the Lord. You go and ask the Lord to answer that prayer. 
but then do you just sit on your couch and watch TV? Of course not. You think that prayer is going to be answered by doing that? It's happened once to me, just once, all right? Just once. Well, I was looking for work and someone came and offered me work, all right? Just once. But every other time, I've had to go and seek, all right? I had to go to seek.com, literally, all right? Seek.com, look for work, get to that workplace, and actually literally knock and say, I'm here for my interview, all right? So look, yes, take your request to God, but what you have control of, you've got to carry that through. You've got to go and seek the answer. You've got to go and knock. Hey, if you're reading your Bible and you're struggling with something you don't understand, yes, ask the Lord for wisdom, but don't just close up the Bible and say, well, the Lord's going to answer that prayer now. I've asked Him for the answer. No, He wants you to seek. He wants you to keep reading, keep studying, keep finding out the answer. You know, knock and search those things. When you combine that with, with what's in your control, and then you leave what's, you know, what you don't have in your control, you leave that up to God, those two things will answer your prayer. You know, your search for a wife, your search for a husband. You know, do you just ask God, Lord God, please send me a, your, a spouse that I can get married? No, the, the Lord wants you to seek. The Lord wants you to knock. You know, the Lord wants you to introduce yourself to other people that might be looking for a spouse. You know, sell yourself a little bit, just like a job interview, so people can know who you are and make your intentions known. You know, if you do, you carry what you can do, then the Lord will do His part and help you out. Okay? If you want to get married, you need to say, hey, as a man, I've got to make sure that I, I'm in a position where I can provide for my wife. I need to make sure that I have a job where I can put a roof over her head, that I can, I can nourish her and feed her, and if we have children, we can take care of that. You know? Do what you can do and leave to God what you can't do. All right? Don't stress about what you can't achieve. Don't stress about what's out of your hands. Leave that to God in prayer and just do what you can do. All right? And when the Lord sees you take those steps, then He'll answer that prayer. You know, a very practical example of this for me, you guys know when I came and started, well, I had a desire to be a pastor and start a church. I had no idea where I needed to go. No idea whatsoever. You know, and I thought about Adelaide. I was thinking about Adelaide, you know. I, I could have started a church in Adelaide. And... Uh, I was asking the Lord, show me, where do you want me to go, Lord? I have no idea, okay? And I was trying to find a place where there wasn't a soul-winning church, okay? A church that wasn't, you know, didn't, wasn't writing the gospel or wasn't at least doing soul-winning. That's the area that I was looking for. And I packed up our bags with Christina and the kids. We went on a holiday to Adelaide. Hey, it's a longer drive from Sydney to Adelaide than it is from Sydney to the Sunshine Coast, all right? And I did that. We didn't feel any traction. Nothing was really developed in that area. But I truly believe that God saw that, that God saw me seeking that, that God saw me trying to knock doors. I was speaking to pastors of other churches and asking them about the spiritual situation in Adelaide. And I, when we got back, very quickly after we got back, I found out, hey, there's the Sunshine Coast that I need to come to. All right? And I think, I believe the Lord looked at that and said, wow, well, these guys are willing to make, a, I think it was a 16-hour drive, whatever it was, you know, to Adelaide. And if they're doing that, then I'm going to step in and now answer that prayer because I can see, you know, I can see their heart. I can see what they're trying to achieve. I can see this isn't just, just a, a verbal, but they're really trying to do something about this, right? And so, please, guys, when you pray, again, do what you can do, okay? The Lord will see that and He will answer your prayer. Those two things need to come together. Verse number 11. If a son shall ask bread of any of you, that is a fa sorry. If let me read that again. If a son shall ask bread of any of you, that is a father, will he give him a stone? Or if he ask a fish, will he give a fish? Will he for a fish give him a serpent? Or if he shall ask an egg, will he offer him a scorpion? If ye then being evil know how to give good gifts unto your children, how much more shall your heavenly Father give you the Holy Spirit to them that ask him? So in verse 13, when it says, if ye then being evil, okay? So we as fathers, we have our sinful flesh, we have our sins, we have our selfishness, all right? But even if you're not the best father, you know, if your child comes and wants food, all right? You know, unless you're a total derelict, I mean, unless you're a total loser, you know, even a bad father will want to feed his children. Even a bad father, even a sinful father with a sinful flesh, would want to give and nourish his children, okay? And so Jesus Christ says, look, if you guys are able to do that, 
then how much for, more your Father in heaven wants to give you great gifts, which has none of that evil, that doesn't have that sinfulness in him, right? He's perfect, he's pure, he knows our every need, and how much more is he willing to give that to us? But notice that it's not just the physical needs, it's not just the food. In verse 13, he talks about, you know, how much more shall your heavenly Father give the Holy Spirit to them that ask him? All right? So let's think about this for a minute. What does it mean to ask for the Holy Spirit? You know, you could apply that potentially to salvation. You know, people that, you know, call upon the name of the Lord, ask to be saved, to be born of the Holy Spirit, to be born again. Of course, the Lord will give the Holy Spirit in that example. Though I don't think that's what it's being referred to here, because this is someone that's already a child of the Father. Okay? So what we see here is that, you know, as preachers, as people that go out and preach the gospel, if you just stand behind the pulpit and preach the word of God, that we ought to be people, we know there are instructions in the Bible to be filled with the Holy Ghost, right? To be uh, given boldness through the Holy Spirit, to have the power of God upon you as you come and preach the word of God. So if you ask the Father, if you ask God to give you the Holy Spirit, you know, uh, to, to do the works of God, then He wants to give you that Holy Spirit as well. He wants to fill your life with the Holy Ghost so that way you can be, you know, more able to be able to walk in that Spirit and not, you know, give into that flesh. Okay? So both the physical needs and yes, the spiritual needs, God the Father wants to give you those things that ask Him. The last, the last three words in verse 13, or last five words, to them that ask Him. Hey, when you come... Men, when you come and stand behind this pulpit and preach, please get in the habit of asking God to give you the Holy Spirit, to give you the power of the Holy Spirit so you can preach with boldness. Okay? There's a huge difference with someone that preaches in the Spirit and people that preach in the flesh. All right? I mean, it's obvious. It's obvious, right? You see people preach in their own strength, in their own flesh. You can see how they contradict the Word of God. You can see that they don't even open the Word of God, you know, and they just preach their own uh, earthly wisdom. Um, so please, you know, people that come and preach, or even before you go out soul winning, get in the habit, if you don't do it already, ask the Lord to give you the Holy Spirit, to give you that strength that you need. Verse 14. And he was casting out a devil, and it was dumb. And it came to pass when the devil was gone out, the dumb spake, and the people wondered. So Jesus cast out an evil spirit. And verse 15, And some of them said he cast out devils through Beelzebub, the chief of the devils. And others tempting him, sought of him a sign from heaven. So this is recorded in Matthew 12. And I actually get you to turn to Matthew 12. Keep your finger there in Luke um, 11. But turn to Matthew 12 as well. These statements of people that say that he's casting out devils through Beelzebub, in Matthew 12, it's recorded as the blasphemy against the Holy Ghost. Okay? Matthew 12, verse 32. Matthew 12, verse 32. The Bible says, And whosoever speaketh a word against the Son of Man, it shall be forgiven him. But whosoever speaketh against the Holy Ghost, it shall not be forgiven him, neither in this world, neither in the world to come. I mean, these words are black and white of Jesus Christ. That you can be someone that will not receive forgiveness in the world to come. You can be someone that takes an action that, uh, that frustrates and angers God so much that even if you were seeking forgiveness by God, that He would not forgive you. Okay? You know, this doctrine of reprobate is a true doctrine. All right? There are people that have done certain acts where God says, Enough! I'm done with you. You cannot be saved. You will not believe on me. And they're ultimately destined to hell. This is an example of a reprobate. Someone that has blasphemed against the Holy Ghost. What have they done? What have they actually said? It's because they've equated Jesus Christ and His powers, the works of God that Jesus was doing, the casting out the devils, the healing of the sick. And they've said that's the power of Satan. That's the power of Beelzebub. You know, they've said, look, he's casting out... Basically, they're saying, look, Jesus is of the devil. You know, he's a son of the devil and he's got the power of the devil. That is ultimately what the blasphemy of the Holy Ghost is. And if you're making those kinds of accusations against Christ, that's, you're going to be someone that cannot be saved. 
right? Now let me just say this. If you're saved, you're saved. Eternal security. Once saved, always saved. Amen? All right? So, you know, if you've said some things and you're like, oh man, did I blaspheme? Look, if you're saved, you're saved. Okay? You, you, you wouldn't be able to blaspheme the Holy Spirit. Okay? You've accepted Jesus Christ. You've accepted that he's the Son of God, obviously. So you're not going to be this person that blasphemes the power of Jesus Christ that comes with the Holy Spirit. All right? But I just want to show you that there. That's, and the people that said these things, by the way, um, were, were the Pharisees. Okay? And so we see that there were certain Pharisees in Jesus' time that were reprobate. Okay? Verse 17. I mean, if they weren't before, they are now, essentially, right? Verse 17. But he, knowing their thoughts, said unto them, Every kingdom divided against itself is brought to desolation, and a house divided against a house falleth. If Satan also be divided against himself, how shall his kingdom stand? Because ye say that I cast out devils through Beelzebub. So notice the words of Christ there. He basically says that Satan has a kingdom, right? Satan has a kingdom on this earth. And he's saying, look, if, if I'm doing this by the power of the devil, by the power of Beelzebub, casting out devils, then that kingdom would not be able to stand. In other words, the devil would be stupid, would be foolish to cast out his own devils because that would cause his kingdom to fall, his own house to fall. All right? How shall his kingdom stand? In verse, uh, sorry, what am I reading from? I'm reading from Luke. Sorry, guys. I've confused myself a little bit. I was reading from Luke uh, eleven seventeen, 17. But I want you guys to keep a finger there in, in Matthew 12 anyway. But yeah, I'm reading from Luke 17. And then uh, he says in verse 18, um, If Satan also be divided against himself, how shall his kingdom stand? Because you say that I cast out devils through Beelzebub. Okay? Verse 19, And if I by Beelzebub cast out devils, by whom do your sons cast them out? Therefore, they sh uh, sh therefore shall they be your judges. Now, you're in Matthew um, 12, look at verse 24. Look at Matthew 12, 24. Just to, just to show you who's saying this, I already mentioned it, but it says there in verse 24, But when the Pharisees heard it, they said, This fellow doth not cast, doth not cast out devils, but by Beelzebub, the prince of the devils. All right? Now, back to Luke, 7, Luke 11, 19, please. Luke 11, 19. Um, notice that Jesus says here, if I buy Beelzebub and cast out devils, by whom do your sons cast them out? Now, this is a bit of a tricky verse. I'll give you probably two, two ways to interpret this. All right, I'll, give you, I'll give you the first way that I don't really agree with. But one way is this. These sons are the sons of the Pharisees. Okay? So he's saying, look, the sons of the, this, one way to interpret it is this. That the sons of the Pharisees were claiming to cast out devils, but were not. Okay, they were claiming to cast out devils. We we're claiming that they had the powers to, ca to cast out devils. So, you know, in, in that case, Jesus was, was, is kind of being sarcastic about it, right? And then it says, therefore shall they be your judges. And, and the way you will take that verse in that, with that interpretation is, therefore shall they, the devils, uh, be your judges. In other words, devils that have been cast out, they're going to make judgment as to who cast them out. Was it Jesus Christ or was it the sons of the Pharisees? So that's one way to interpret that verse. I know it's a bit tricky, but I prefer to take this verse pretty much at just face value. You know, just, just, just as literal as you can there. And I, I appreciate your thoughts later on. If you guys have some thoughts on this verse, let me know. But the way I seem to understand this, um, it says that by whom do your sons cast them out? I just take that at face value that some of the sons of the Pharisees were casting out devils, okay? And how would they be able to cast out devils? The only way they'd be able to do that is if Jesus Christ gave them that ability, if that Jesus Christ gave them that power. So I assume here, without it being clear in this passage, that some of the children of the Pharisees had actually come to believe on the Lord Jesus Christ, okay? And they might very well be numbered amongst those 70. Remember Jesus Christ gave the 70 uh, uh, disciples, the ability to cast out devils, to heal the sick, you know, not just the 12. So it's possible that some of the sons of the Pharisees, some of the children of the Pharisees, were part of this 70, given the power of Christ to cast out devils. And so he's saying then, therefore shall they, your sons, be your judges. Hey, your sons have said they've cast out devils. Maybe those Pharisees have praised them, 
And, but they're saying, hey, they've cast out devils through the power of the Lord Jesus Christ. So that, that's how I prefer to interpret it. But if you guys have some other ideas there, I realize that it's a little challenging. Uh, I appreciate your thoughts. But look at verse number 20. But if I, with the finger of God, cast out devils, no doubt the kingdom of God is come upon you. All right? So I've been talking to you a little bit about the kingdom of God. I'm trying to build up some thoughts here, get into chapter 13 eventually. But I want you to notice that Jesus Christ says, no doubt the kingdom of God is come upon you. Okay? Now again, we talk about the kingdom of God, a lot of people think about the millennial kingdom to come. And that's true, it's awesome. But do you also notice that he says the kingdom of God is come upon you? It's here now. Okay? And he equates that with the casting out of devils and the taking down of the kingdom of Satan. Something that you'll come to realize is that when the kingdom of God comes and he grows into that millennial kingdom and then eventually the new heavens and the new earth, that the kingdom of Satan is taking a back seat. It's taking a, a beating through the kingdom of God. Okay, we'll see this a little play out a little bit more. Look at verse 21. When a strong man armed keep of his palace his goods are in peace but when a stronger than he shall come upon him and overcome him he taketh from him all his armor wherein he trusted and divided his spoils so we see this this uh, sort of illustration here that if there's a strong man and i believe this is a reference to the devil or to devils that has his place that has his things in order um, but when a stronger than him shall come that's a reference to Jesus, to God coming in. He's able to overcome the devil, takes away the armor that he trusted, and divideth his spoils. So in the context here of a possessed man, of Jesus casting out the devil, we see that the devil, or whatever devils they were, had taken hold of this man. Yeah, the devil being a strong man, had taken it, had owned it, but then a stronger than he came in, Jesus Christ, and, and, and took away uh, what the devil was trusting in, probably maybe that the soul of that man or whatever, takes away the armor, takes away the weapons, and divides his spoils. He takes what belonged to the devil at one point in time. Okay? He recovers that man. He heals that man from that pos the, the possession of that devil. And so what we see here is when the king of God comes down, the kingdom, the kingdom of Satan takes a back step. Okay? It's, it's, it's demolished. It's taken down a notch. Okay? And ultimately, it'll be done away with when Satan is cast into the lake of fire forever and ever. All right? Um, and of course, I'll just quickly read to you 1 John 4 4. The Bible, very, a great passage. Ye are of God, little children, and have overcome them, because greater is he that is in you than he that is in the world. Hey, the fact that you have the Holy Ghost, which is God, residing in you, dwelling in you, means you don't have to have the fear of the devil. You don't have to be afraid that he's going to come and possess your body or anything like that. Hey, you have the power of God in you, all right? You call upon you, ask the Lord for help, and he's going to deliver you from the powers of the devil. We don't need to be afraid of him. We need to be aware of him. We need to be aware of the danger and the damage that the devil can cause, but we don't need to be afraid, okay? Because we have the Holy Ghost. Verse 23. He that is not with me is against me, and he that gathereth not with me scattereth. Alright? So, basically, being with Jesus is one that is in the gathering business. We see that when Jesus Christ came, he's preaching the gospel, he's gathering people unto himself. When he's casting out these devils, you know, these people are coming and sitting to hear the word of God and, and to, to be saved. And the Bible is very clear here, guys, that we need to be people that are involved in the gathering business of God. All right? If you're not gathering with Christ, then you're scattering. All right? If you're not involved in trying to get the gospel out there, getting pe bringing people in, gathering people in. I'm not necessarily talking about the church, but we, we can associate that as well. But getting people saved, bringing into the kingdom, then Jesus says you're scattering. Okay? You, you can never be a neutral in the Christian walk. You're either doing the Lord's business or you're hurting the Lord's business. All right? Verse 24. Verse, uh, sorry, verse um, 
And actually, no, there's something that I wanted to comment here because the question came. Keep your finger there. Turn to Luke chapter 9 very quickly. Luke chapter 9, verse 49. Luke chapter 9, verse 49. Luke chapter 9, verse 49. So just two chapters back. These words were said by uh, John the Apostle. And John answered and said, Master, we saw one casting out devils in thy name, and we forbade him, because he followeth not with us. And Jesus said unto him, Forbid him not, for he that is not against us is for us. So some people think that verse there sounds a little contradictive. It's obviously not contradictive, but... It sounds a little bit with what we just read in, in Luke 11.23, which said, um, He that is not with me is against me. All right? So let's try to understand this. Is this an apparent contradiction between these two verses? The reason, it, the reason it's not a contradiction is because the person in Luke 9 is casting out devils in the name of Jesus Christ. He's doing the works of God. Okay? He's doing the works of God. And so as far as you're, if you're doing the works of God, as far as Jesus is concerned, is that you're not against him, but that you're for him. Okay? That you're for him. But it's the disciple that said, well, hold on. He's not walking with us. He's not following after us. They're not in lockstep with us. That for him, because of that, he felt that this person was against them. Okay, so when we look at verse at Luke eleven twenty three, Jesus says, "He that is not with me is against me." Okay, and then obviously, "He that gathereth not with me scattereth." So here's 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 the here's how we put it together, and we can relate this to other churches, other pastors, other ministries, whatever. If there's another church, okay, that's I've said this before, that's right on the gospel, that has the same Jesus, that has you know the same Spirit. And their mission is to get the gospel out. They're doing the works of God, even though they might be not be doing it in the same way that we think is the best way to do it. Okay? That is someone that is not against Christ and is with, with Him. Okay? But if you've got other people that are not involved in the gathering business, they're not involved in doing the works of God, then at that point, they're against Christ. Okay? So, you know, don't ever think that the only people that are right, the only people that are for Christ, are those that are just like us, that are just like-minded like us, that believe just like us. Hey, look, even within this church, we don't necessarily believe everything exactly the same on, on, on certain issues, all right? Does that, does that mean that, we, okay, we can't work together? No, of course not. If we're in the Lord's business, we're gathering, we're serving Him, doing what we can to bring the kingdom of God a little closer, bringing people into that kingdom, then we're gathering and we're not against Christ. And any other church that's doing that, I don't care what movement they're part of or what this or what that, all I care about, are they right in the gospel? Are they trying to serve the Lord? And if they're doing that, I'm, I'm, I'm more than happy to be a blessing to them, to open up communication with them and, and work with them. All right? Let's look at verse 24. Luke eleven twenty-four. <clears throat> now, before we read this, this is not a continuation of the previous conversation uh, Jesus Christ had about the stronger man overcoming the strong man. Okay? In Luke, it sounds like they're the same story, but it's verse 23 that separates these two stories. All right? Now, this is a lot more obvious in Matthew chapter 12. Okay? We won't read it in Matthew 12, but if you have time, read this again in Matthew 12, and you'll notice that it's very obvious these are not the same story. Okay? These are totally different things. Verse 24. When the unclean spirit is gone out of a man, he walketh through dry places, seeking rest and finding none, he saith, I will return unto my house whence I came out. All right. So some people have associated this with an unclean spirit that Jesus Christ has cast out of a man. That's not necessarily what this is about. This is just about an unclean spirit that has gone out of a man for whatever reason. All right. And notice that when, when an unclean spirit, when a devil leaves a man, it walks through dry places seeking rest. Now, I don't understand all this. This is the spiritual realm. But for whatever reason, these unclean spirits find rest, find nourishment, find joy in possessing people. Okay? And when they're not possessing people, 
it's like walking in a desert, desert place for them. All right? And then he says, look, he saith, I will return unto my house whence I came out. Verse 25. And when he cometh, he findeth it, he find it swept and garnished. So he comes back to the person that he possessed, and he finds this person has cleaned up their life. Like they swept a lot of the rubbish out of their life. They're doing much better. All right? And then verse 26. Then goeth he and taketh to him seven other spirits more wicked than himself, and they enter in and dwell there. And the last state of that man is worse than the first. All right, so let's understand this. I believe this story is about those that are trying to get right before God through um, self-reformation. Okay? They, they've lived a wicked life. They recognize, yep, you know, I've done wrong. I'm a sinner, etc., etc. But they're like, you know what? To be right with God, I'm just going to clean up my life. I'm going to repent of my sins. Right? And I'm going to follow the laws of God. I'm going to keep the commands of God. But they miss out on the free gift. They miss out on, on understanding that salvation, being right with God, is that free gift. And as we know, when you get saved, you have the Holy Ghost in you, right? which is greater than he that is in the world. All right? That is, is a stronger man than the devil that were there before. But what we find here is that when the devil comes back, there's no one there. This person's not saved. It's just been swept. It's been cleaned. It's actually more attractive now to come and possess this man. So he brings his eight or seven other devil buddies that are worse than him and trash up the place. Okay? So we need to be careful about, you know, a, a gospel of self-reformation. You know? A gospel that says, hey, just do good. Just, just do the best you can. You know, just, just clean up your life. Repent of all your sins. And that's how you get saved. Hey, that's, that's the person that the devils want to inhabit. That's the person the devils want to come in and destroy their lives. All right? Verse number 27. And it came to pass as he spake these things, a certain woman of the company lifted up her voice and said unto him, Blessed is the womb that bare thee, and the paps which thou sucked. So here we have our first Roman Catholic. Right before the Roman Catholic Church started, here's the woman that wants to uh, give you know, Mary worship and, and praise. And look, Mary was a blessed woman, don't get me wrong. You know, she's a fantastic woman. The real Mary, the Mary of the Bible. You know, she's, a, she's a fantastic woman, a great role model for any young lady to follow after. Okay? But look how Jesus Christ responds in verse 28. But he said, Yea, rather, blessed are they that hear the word of God and keep it. So we see how Jesus deflects the attention that Mary started to get, all right? And we can see, obviously, with the Roman Catholic Church and, and how much they praise and worship Mary, Jesus Christ says, no, look, rather, what's better than that? Uh, uh, to bless those that hear the Word of God and keep it. Those that hear it and essentially do it. They know the Word of God, they, they follow through and, and, um, and try to keep the commands that God has given us. Verse 29, And when the people were gathered thick together, he began to say, this is an evil generation. They seek a sign. And there shall no sign be given it but the sign of Jonas the prophet. For as Jonas was a sign unto the Ninevites, so shall also the Son of Man be to this generation. So Jonah was a sign to the Ninevites that he was swallowed by that whale, that he was spat out, right? And he went preaching to the Ninevites. And he refers to himself that same uh, example, that same sign would be of Jesus Christ to this generation. And we know, just like Jonah, the three, nights, uh, and th the three days and three nights in the whale, that Christ himself, after three days and three nights, would rise again from the dead. That he would overcome death and present himself. Jesus Christ here is basically saying, the sign, what's important, what you guys need to understand, is that I'm going to die for your sins, and I'm going to rise again. I'm going to come back. That's the sign that you're going to get. Hey, that's the gospel message that we go out and preach. That's the sign for this wicked generation as much as that wicked generation. That death could not keep him. Verse 31. The queen of the south shall rise up in judgment against... Sorry, rise up in judgment with the men of this generation and condemn them. For she came from the utmost parts of the earth to hear the wisdom of Solomon. Behold, a greater than Solomon is here. So this is confirmation to us that the queen of Sheba got saved in the Old Testament. That she got saved when she came and heard Solomon and Solomon saying how much God had blessed Israel and she was impressed by everything Israel had. But this shows us that Solomon also preached the gospel. 
all right, that she had placed her faith on God, that she can rise up in judgment against that wicked generation. Verse 32, the men of Nineveh shall rise up in judgment against this generation and shall condemn it. For they repented at the preaching of Jonas, and behold, a greater than Jonas is here. All right, so we are Ninevites. The Ninevites got saved at the preaching of Jonah. Okay, now, did every Ninevite get saved? Probably not, but a great majority did. The king even got himself right with God, and, and they, they ended up cleaning up their city. And God did not bring judgment on them at that time. All right? But what's significant about these two examples is, again, these are two Gentiles. The Queen of Sheba, she's not a Jew, she's a Gentile. The Ninevites, they were Gentiles. Okay? And Jesus is saying, hey, there's going to be Gentile believers that are going to stand in judgment against you Jews. You Jews that should be people that are accepting me. Hey, I'm greater than Solomon, I'm greater than Jonas, and you won't even receive me. These people received prophets that were lesser than me. And they're going to be ones that in the judgment time are going to say words against you. All right? We see that, you know, Jesus Christ, we see it many times. He lifts up the Gentiles, the Gentile believers. All right? They're not a second class citizen to him. Okay? Verse 33. No man, when he have lighted a candle, put it in a secret place, neither under a bushel, but on a candlestick that they which come in may see the light. The light of the body is the eye. Wherefore, when thine eye be single... Let me just stop there. So the light of the body is the eye. So if you guys know how the eye works, it's the part of your body that receives light. You get light, enters into your lens, and it hits the retina at the back. So it's the part of your body that receives light. And then it says, Therefore, when thine eye is single... That word single, it's kind of like, you know, a single is one, and one is a whole. So it's essentially it's saying that um, when your eye is whole, when it's, when, it's, when, it's, when it's good, when it's working, okay? It says, thy, thy, whole, thy whole body also is full of light. So if your eye is, is, is healthy and good and whole, you receive light. You know, you can see where you're walking, all right? The reason I can, my whole body has light is because of my eyes. My eyes can see what, what's right, and I can walk and, and be careful of any dangerous things, all right? But then it says, but when thine eye is evil or harmed, because evil is another way of saying harm. So when your eyes harmed or damaged or maybe partly blind or cataracts or whatever, it says thy body also is full of darkness. So if you can't see well, it's going to cause your whole body to be in darkness. You won't be able to see where you're going. Verse 35. Take heed therefore that the light which is in thee be not darkness. If thy whole body therefore be full of light, having no part dark, the whole shall be full of light. And when the bright shining of a candle... Sorry, as when the bright shining of a candle doth give thee light. So we see, I think what Jesus Christ is saying here is that these people around him are, are, are seeing him cast out devils, are seeing him preach and do great works, all right? And that Jesus Christ is this light, that is this great light, okay? And those that can see on that, receive that light, they're going to be full of light. They're going to know uh, how to be saved. They're going to know how to please the Lord. They're going to know how to walk in the paths that Jesus Christ has left us. But there are others that see that same light, like these Pharisees, and say it's the work of the devil and whatever. They're spiritually darkened. Okay? They have the cataracts. They're partly blind. And instead of receiving that light, they're receiving darkness. Okay? They're not receiving Christ. Is essentially what's being taught there. Verse 37. And as he spake, a certain Pharisee besought him to dine with him. And he went in and sat down to meet. And when the Pharisees saw it, he marveled that he had not first washed before dinner. So I don't know, did Jesus not wash his hands? Or was this, was this a ceremonial washing of the Pharisees? I'm not exactly sure, but Jesus did not wash his hands. Or whatever, right? Verse 39. And the Lord said unto him, Now do ye Pharisees make clean the outside of the cup and the platter, but your inward part is full of ravening and wickedness. The word ravening is basically they prey on other people. Okay? It says, look, you Pharisees, you're so concerned about the outside being clean, but inwardly, you have no care for other people. You're taking advantage of others. Okay? You're wicked on the inside, is what Jesus says. All right? On the outward, they appear holy, but inwardly, disgusting. Verse 42. Oh, sorry. Um, 40. Verse 40. Ye fools, did not he that made that which is without make that which is within also? You know, God made the outside, but God also made the inside. Both are important, is what Jesus is saying. Verse 41, But rather give alms of such things as ye have, 
and behold, all things are clean unto you. So it says, look, you're not, you're not giving alms. You're not helping uh, those that you can help. You're not being merciful. You're not being compassionate to other people. Okay, you're not giving of yourselves. You're not giving alms. You're not doing good works to others. If you were doing that, at least you'd be clean on the inside as well. You know, the, the inward will, 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 will match up with the outward. You know, verse 42. But woe unto you Pharisees, for ye tithe mint and rue and all manner of herbs and pass over judgment and the love of God. These ought ye to have done and not to leave the other undone. So you see, the Pharisees were concerned about minor things about tithing even on little herbs. Okay, they'd give a tenth of their little herb, right? Now, Jesus is not criticizing them over that because he says, uh, these ought ye to have done. Like, you're, that's right. But you're so focused on the little things that, you're, you don't, that you pass over judgment and the love of God. You, you, um, basically, when it comes to judgment, you don't do what's right. You don't judge correctly. You don't show the love of God to other people. You know, these are the greater things. These are the more important things. You're doing the little thing, which, yeah, it's good, but you're not doing what's more important, okay? But Jesus Christ basically says, look, both of these things are to be done. Some people have used verse 42 to say, well, God's done away with tithing. But no, Jesus is saying, look, yeah, it's, you should be doing that as well, okay? But you're missing the point. You're missing the point. Verse uh, 43, Woe unto you Pharisees, for you love the utmost seats in the synagogues and greetings in the markets. Um, look, if our church grows and we need a bigger building one day, I'm never going like, to get nice chairs up here where, you know, let's say I have a song leader and then I'm just sitting here and I'm just watching you guys, you know. I've got the, the prominent seat here, you know. I, I don't like churches that do that where you actually have seats and they have like all the important men like sitting on the seats and then, you know, the lesser of you guys are down in the congregation. You know, I have a lot of respect for pastors of big churches that actually when they're not sitting down, they actually sit down in the congregation with everyone else. You know, which I'm just one of you guys. It's essentially what's being said there. You know, we see the Pharisees, no, they want the good seats. They want to look good. You know, they want to be seen of men. Verse 42, 44. Woe unto you, scribes and Pharisees, hypocrites! For ye, are, for ye are as graves which appear not, and the men that walk over them are not aware of them. So obviously we've got dead bodies in graves. People are not aware of their filthiness. They see the nice on the outside, but they don't see the dead bodies under the grave verse 46 um <clears throat> sorry verse 45 and then answered one of the lawyers and said unto him master thus saying thou reproaches us also he says look master lord you're preaching against the pharisees but this is affecting us it sounds like you're preaching against us master what have we done wrong right it's so funny and then in verse 40 46 and he said woe unto you also ye lawyers for ye laid men with burdens grievous to be born, and ye yourselves touch not the burdens with one of your fingers. Hey, you thought you're better than the Pharisees. Woe to you also. You put burdens on other people that you won't even push with one finger. Again, repent of your sins, salvation. Repent of your sins. To be saved, you've got to turn from your sins. Hey, the people that say they have not even turned from their sins. They don't push. You know, they put these burdens on people, these great expectations, and they themselves haven't even done that. Now, it's the same thing. But I want you to notice that Jesus is preaching against the Pharisees and to lawyers that are kind of convicted. It's like, what, are you preaching to us? You know? And uh, I can kind of relate a little bit, you know, preaching. You know, I, I preach whatever I think is right for the church. I, I don't necessarily preach about, you know, it's, it's very rare that I would preach about something specific that's going on. And I thought, I better preach on that, right? Usually I just preach whatever. You know, and now that I'm doing chapter by chapter, I preach whatever's there. But sometimes when I preach, people come to me and um, say, oh, Oh, I know why you preach that, because of so-and-so or such-and-such. -such. Like, no, <laughs> so it's not why. And I think that's what we see in Jesus Christ. Like, he wasn't really preaching to the lawyers. Hey, but if it's got to do with you, if it, if, if it does affect you, then take it on board. It's for you. All right? It's for, it is for you. All right? May the Holy Ghost is, is applying that to your situation as well. You know? And um, that, this happens a lot when you preach, because like, oh, it must have been about that person. Look, don't worry about who you think it's about. It's about you. Whatever's being preached, you've got to take that on board and apply that to your life, all right? And it's, it's very tempting because I've, obviously I've sat in church as well. I've heard preach and I'm like, oh yeah, brother so-and-so really needed to hear that, you know, sister so-and-so needed to hear that. And it's like, no, actually I needed to hear that, right? It's me that needed to take that on board and change my life, apply that to my life. Uh, verse um, 40, what am I up to guys, 47? 47. 
Woe unto you, for ye build the sepulchres, sepulchres of the prophets, those are graves, and your fathers killed them. Truly ye bear witness, and ye allow the deeds of your fathers, for they indeed killed them, and ye build their sepulchres. So Jesus is, is criticizing these uh, Pharisees and these lawyers for building up sepulchres, like making the graves of the prophets nice, I guess, pretty. Now, first of all, there's nothing wrong in of that, of that in of itself, okay? That's not really the issue. But look, we'll look, look at verse 49. Oh, actually, before I read 49, the issue is that these people are rejecting the preaching of Christ, okay? They're, they're rejecting the message that Jesus Christ came, okay? And it's, it's the same message of the former prophets. Hey, all the prophets came to bear record of Jesus Christ, to bear witness of Jesus Christ. It's the same message from the beginning, all right? So if you reject the message of Christ, you're essentially rejecting the message of all the prophets that have come before him, okay? That's why Jesus Christ said that, you know, if you believed Moses when he said to the Pharisees, you would have believed in me, okay? The fact that you don't believe in me means that you don't even believe Moses, all right? So I want you to understand, they, they make these uh, graves nice, that's not really the problem. The problem is they reject the message of these prophets, okay? They're being hypocritical. Verse 49, Therefore also said the wisdom of God, now this is interesting, this is a conversation that God the Father had with the Son at some point, okay? This is not recorded in Scripture anywhere else. <clears throat> it says, Therefore also said the wisdom of God, I will send them prophets and apostles, and some of them they shall slay and persecute, that the blood of all the prophets which were shed from the foundation of the world may be required on this generation. For the blood of Abel unto the blood of Zacharias, which perished between the altar and the temple, verily I say unto you, it shall be required of this generation. Okay? Just like the queen of Sheba, just like the Ninevites heard the, the preaching of the prophets of old, and they got right with God, and they're going to be brought uh, to judge against that wicked generation, then we also know that this generation of Pharisees and leaders would reject Christ, they would be guilty of the blood of Christ, they would crucify Him, reject Him, hate Him, and because of that, they will be then guilty of all the prophets that have come before. All the prophets that came to say, hey, Christ is coming, put your faith on Him. They're going to be guilty of all that. It's a significant punishment for the Jews of this day. All right. Uh, verse 52. Woe unto you lawyers, for ye have taken away the key of knowledge, and, and uh, ye entered not in yourselves, and them that were entering ye hindered. Man, look, you lawyers, you've taken away the knowledge, you've, you've prevented people from receiving me, from hearing the gospel. And this is a sad thing. It says, it says ye entered not in yourselves, and them that were entering in ye hindered. Hey, there were people that were coming to Christ, that were starting to understand, coming to, uh, to, to believe on Him and trying to accept it. And the lawyer said, no, he's a false prophet. No, he's of Beelzebub. He cast out devils of Beelzebub. And that's hindered them from coming in and receiving salvation. What a sad thing. And again, we see this at the door, right? Someone willing to, to hear the gospel, someone behind the door says, hey, they're not interested, or whatever. And they, they shut the door of the gospel on that person. What great judgment will come upon those people? Verse 53. And he said these things unto them, the scribes and the Pharisees. <clears throat> and as he said these things unto them, the scribes and the Pharisees began to urge him vehemently and to provoke him to speak of many things, laying wait for him to, and seeking to catch something out of his mouth that they, that they might accuse him. So... um. Just my last thoughts on this. Just be careful of people. Be careful of the conversations you have, especially on social media. Because we see here that there were people waiting, asking Jesus a lot of questions, seeing like they're just genuine people, just trying to get answers. But really, they were just trying to catch something out of Jesus' mouth. All right? Trying to find him say something. And look, you know, thank God this has died down for me. But when I first put my phone number on the church website, and this was after several months that we had started this church, I got so many weirdos calling me, okay? Uh, and I, I couldn't really understand why. I just put my phone number out there. It's almost like people were waiting for an opportunity, looking at our website. When's that phone number coming up? There it is. Now I'm going to call it. 
almost looking, and the questions, at first they seemed genuine. At first I thought maybe these are people that I can preach the gospel to. You know, I can answer their questions, then I get my chance to preach the gospel, hopefully they get saved. But the wickedness that would come out of the mouth, the, the kinds of questions that would come, and I was a bit naive at the beginning, I thought well, maybe this is, this is how it always is. Maybe, maybe pastors are always getting these kinds of calls, right? But it's died down since then. But my point is, I, I've come to realize these people were trying to find something out of my mouth, trying to find something that they can grasp and try to destroy this church very early, try to destroy my ministry. I don't know who these people were. I have no idea. But it's obviously people that are following what's going on, people that are watching that this church has been established. It's probably people that are closer to us than we realize. There are people that are trying to just find fault, trying to destroy the work of God. Please be careful, all right? Uh, you know, I, I tend to have a big heart for people. People talk to me. I'm willing to talk to them and, and, and answer questions. And I, it comes later on to realize, hey, this person probably means harm. This person probably is a wolf and trying to hurt me or hurt my church or whatever. So be careful, especially on social media, especially on the internet. Because whatever you type, whatever you post is on the internet forever. Forever! <laughs> right? I mean, I can say something to you today and be like, maybe I'm wrong, but then maybe... In six months, I might correct it and say, well, actually, I was a bit mistaken there, blah, blah, blah. But if I took what was wrong and I pushed that on the internet, hey, 10 years, you know, in 10 years' time, someone's going to find that comment somewhere and then be like, look what this person believes, look what this person teaches. And we, I've seen that happen over and over again. So I guess just learn from the example of Jesus Christ here. Be mindful as to who you talk to. You know, not everyone that wants to talk to you about the Bible is actually genuine. There are people that actually want to seek and destroy us. And um, you might say, well, that's a bit sad. Well, at the same time, hey, it's good because we must be doing something right. You know, we must be doing something right if the devil wants to send his ministers and try to hurt us, all right? We're hurting his kingdom, you know, as we help bring that kingdom of God uh, in here onto, onto the Sunshine Coast. All right, let's pray.